And good evening. This is George Pardos, your host of The Warrior Wallet, and welcome to our Thursday night edition of the show. So tonight we're going to cover what seems to be a, a, a growing problem in for veterans and for you know people that are going out there and taking a look at jobs. Because one of the things that I have not seen and, and especially late, uh, recently, is that I, I don't see as many I don't see as many people going out there and giving advice on on how to apply for a job, and not only just to apply for a job, but also some of the pitfalls in a job interview. Now, let me say this: I came from an era when I graduated college in 1993, and I got out of the Marine Corps in 1988. Job interviews were almost all analog. They, there was no digital. You didn't send your resume to people over, you know, a fax or even email. There's no email back then. You had to, you know, basically mail it or drop it off at the HR's desk. And so there was a lot more. It, it was not as complex. Now today, you have. For example, there there are programs that HR uses. I, I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but there are programs that HR companies use to actually screen for keywords when you're going out on a job interview or for a resume or for a position, and they're called uh, predictive analysis. And one of the things that they do is that they make sure that the person that is supplying the resume has given the, the, the right amount of information about the resume. Um, you know, so for example, if you're applying for a sales position, they're going to kind of screen your resume for certain keywords. And they use a logarithm that gives you a predictive analysis. And then it it pops up the, the candidates with the most amount of keywords that is pertinent to that position and in general. So it's a lot more complex than it used to be. Partly too is also we're in a t in, in certain jobs it's a, it's a wide open market. Companies can't find enough people to work. So they're looking for employees, but for certain positions that are very the the top let's say the top 5% People are then fighting over those positions, and they're, they're not always getting them. So here's, here's the first thing I, I will say, the first step in getting to a good job interview is make sure your resume is on point. There are plenty of resume writing services and resume tablet forms that you can fill out your resume. Here's one thing I, I, have, always, I, I have always said about resumes and I'm going to give you a little back history. I went to the IBM Selling School in Connecticut. Now, the IBM Selling School is a month-long school that teaches you how to be a salesperson, and it's a very intense, very intense school. You're working 10 hours a day, and you are sitting there with other professionals from all walks of life to go to the school, and it's a, it is not easy. So... Now they've they've changed it a little bit, but for the most part, it it is a school that teaches you from point A to B in business, and also how to get to what they used to call veto, which is a very important officer in the company to sell to. But one of the things that they always said too is that if you're looking for a job and you're having to turn in your resume, keep it simple. Number two, don't lie on your resume because if you get hired with a fraudulent resume and this has happened recently and more so than not the company the companies have gone after and sued employers for recouping the cost of the hiring process so don't lie on your resume don't embellish just tell the truth and if you don't want to say to you know more into depth keep it simple so that's one thing I say about your resume. So make sure that your resume is on point and make sure that it is written for the job you're applying for. If you're in, in, employing in 
I'm sorry, if you're applying for a position in sales and marketing, you need to have at least some experience in sales and marketing or at least understand what that field is. So those are the first things. Make sure, number two, make sure on your resume you read it backwards and you go from bottom to top. Do not read it um, forward and to the end. Read it backwards. Why? Because you want to make sure that grammatical and spelling errors are not there. There is nothing worse a, as a an employer than getting a resume with a spelling error. Um, it, it is just absolutely god awful. Um, it just shows that the person it, you know wasn't even trying, or you know, I mean, just it, it's literally one of the worst things you can do. So that is one of the things that I that I point out is make sure that. The first thing that they include in your in your resume is also a cover letter. Now, some of those have been, you know, it, it's gone back and forth. Some people say send a cover letter. Some people don't. I Again, it, it's one of those things that you have. I, it, I've, I've been taught that it was, it, it was, it's good form. I would send a cover letter. I would never submit my resume to a firm that is you know without a, a cover letter I just wouldn't do that but then again I'm going to be applying for different positions than maybe some of you so you know it partly is based on the on the position and so, you know there there are some positions that a cover letter is not necessary if you're looking for some positions and you you know, they're, they're suggesting that you submit a cover letter. I, I always look at it like this. There's there's three tiers of resumes. One of them is, are you going to have a prefix behind your name? Um, you know, CFO, CEO, you know, CIO, any of those, then include a cover letter. If you're going to have, you know, VP sales, VP operations, include a cover letter. If you're just looking for an entry-level job, Mm, maybe, maybe not. So again, like I said, not all the the jobs are not every job is is the same. And so let you know, let's be you know, let's be honest about that. There are some things that uh, you know that are going to be different jobs are going to entail different a different work hours, different work ethic, work ethics, and so on. So here's the the first thing about you know, let's get the resume part out of the way. So you got the job interview. You're, let's say that I, I'm going to use a company that I that I interviewed with before, and I'm going to give you some of the things. They're an IBM platform company, which means that they follow the IBM model of structure. That they follow the IBM model of hiring, and they ask a lot of the same questions that corporate 500 companies are going to to ask. So let's take a look at the first. You know, the, so, there's some common questions that they're going to ask, and it doesn't matter where you, you're going to. The first thing that most companies are going to ask you when you sit down and, across from, and you're either going to sit down across from an individual or a panel. So you sit across, tell me about yourself. Make sure that you have that answer pretty well dead on. You want to make sure that you know what what they're looking for, and and here's what they're looking for. When they're asking you to to tell them about yourself, they're seeing how open you are with a group, and so they're looking for a person that is at least able to share information with them. And the reason is that again, you don't want to be you don't want to hire a guy that is like. I don't know. I'm. I just. Uh, I want to work, and but I don't know. And now, tell me about yourself. Well, you know, my name is George Pardos. I'm a, you know, a, a graduate of the Ohio State University. I'm a veteran. I, the reason I'm looking for to work at your company is because I've heard great things. You know, those are kind of the things that break the ice. And and, and again. You know, it depends on how you were at, how you got into the interview also is a little bit more about how, how you respond to certain things, too. Um, in today's platform, for example, 
being a veteran, I think is a plus. I, I don't think it always used to be. And I, I'll tell you this, in the 80s, a lot of people had a disdain for veterans. And I think it was, it was a leftover from Vietnam that it was... I, and w one of the things, and, and I'll tell you this, one of the things that happened is when there was a lot of people that had the idea that when you went for an inter you know, that when you went into the military in the 80s, you're plain stupid. Now, part of it was that we had a high employment rate. The, there was, there was the participation in the labor force was a lot higher. And so as a result, people kind of looked, oh, why are you, why are you going in the military? Yeah, there's, well, and, and so, again, I think this era is a little bit different. And I think you, you, you can't tell people that you're, you're a veteran. So going back to this, tell me about yourself. Make sure you have a story. What, what's your story? What, what did you, you know, why are you here? Well, and, and tell them, say, you know, listen, I, the, you know, this is where, where, what I've accomplished. This is where I'm at. So that is, again, part of that, the, the process is when they're asking you, um, for those questions, it's to be able, are you open enough to share information? Now, Second thing, this is the, the most common. Why are you suitable for this job? Okay. This is where skill sets and trade craft come into play. Now, one of the things that, let, let's say you're, you are applying for a sales position. Okay. doesn't matter the sales position. position. Let's just talk about... Um, Xerox. Again, this is an easy one. I'm a, you know, why are you applying for this job? Tell me about, it. well, the reason I think I would be good at this job is because I, at, you know, at my last position at company X, I did 132% of quota. I had a large marketplace share and I was able to expand our business in, in that marketplace and meet the expectations of the company. I, I was able to direct sales and marketing material. I was able to meet all the quotas and, and tell them exactly what your skill set is. This is where no, a lot of this is where numbers matter. You have to know what the numbers are for doing that. Now, this next question is one of the things that they try to, and, and it depends on, on where in the interview they ask you this because some HR people ask this up front in the first three questions. Some people do not. I mean, I've seen people go into three or four or, you know, uh, three or four on the way in and three quarters of the, you know, through the job interview. And then they won't ask you, you know, then they'll ask you because they, they find out things about you. And then they, you know, they, they, then they want to ask you those questions. So um, let's give you a, um, I'll give you a, a prime example. This is a question that they're going to ask you. What is your biggest weakness? Now, this is a, a this is a minefield. And the reason they're asking you this question is not the reason you think. The reason that they're asking you this question is to see whether you have the the ability to self-reflect. And that is something that is a a pitfall, but they know it's a pitfall. There's no easy way to to answer this question without putting yourself in a certain position. So one of the things that I'll give you an example, something that I would use and it's it's acceptable. Say one of the things that I you can say to a position, say one of my weaknesses is the fact that I'm very accomplished and I'm able to at times take on more than I should. I have to learn how to say no to some projects because at the same time, even though I do have a lot of ability, I know that sometimes that it you can't always focus on one job at the same time. And as a result of that, I, I don't want to leave things out. That's an acceptable one that, that shows that you have capabilities 
and it it also has a, a that you're setting a tone where you are able to um where you are able then to you know to, to have this conversation with them because again they're looking for self reflection they're not looking to be you know they're, to, they're not looking for you to beat yourself up they're looking do you have the ability to self manage because there's a lot of jobs out there that you might be on the road for example as a salesperson you 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 might have outside sales are 20 20 to 30 percent of your time if you're in the technology field 30 to 40 percent of your time is going to be in the field at client visits so those are the types of uh, uh, professions that need to be able to look self-reflect and say yeah I, I this is where i need to be because er, er, you can't be you can't do vertical marketing with a a profession that your sales manager is going to have to stay over you now for example in a car dealership yeah you can it's not you're not doing vertical marketing you're you know you're doing funnel marketing so those are something else that that's the differentiation so one of the other one of the other things that this is again could be a pitfall could be something that they're looking to trip you up with where do you see yourself in five years and the the reason they do this is not again where you know because of they're they're not doing this to trip you up what they're looking for is are you goal goal orientated and goal driven to understand that you know five years is how you build a platform and the reason and now what I'm about to say is questionable, but one of the reasons why a lot of companies pick the five years, it is based on FASB rules. And the reason that they said is because every five years or so, depending on most companies, they they write off five years on their books. It's their amortization schedule. And so as a result, a lot of companies change uh, the way they do things inside of five years and a lot of companies also fail in five years too by the way that you know that's another um that is another story altogether but again what they're asking you on where do you see yourself in five years is what they're trying to say is is this a guy that knows how to make things happen is this guy that knows how to plan because if you aren't stable if you aren't stable at all if, if you're not a if you're not a, a a stable person they are not going to have plans five years down the road they're not going to have plans five minutes down the road they're going to be they're not gonna even going to have plans five you know uh, they don't know what they're going to do for lunch after they leave the building i mean that's again it, it it's there's reasons behind the questions no one asks questions just to hear the sound of their own voice I mean, people, you, you, you might think they do, but again, they're looking to see, are you a kind of person that is being able to plan? Now, this is another tough question, and it's a difficult one to, to answer because you've got to know about your company, and you've also got to know about the company you're working for or the company you're interviewing for. Why do you want to leave your current job? This is again a pitfall question. And pitfall questions are the they are designed that to to see whether you're prepared or not. They're there and designed to see whether you've done your homework or you're just a guy looking at, you know, to add into the there you're just looking to add for a, a job because you don't want to be living in a bridge uh, underneath you know in a cardboard box so the reason they ask you that is why you know why do you want you to leave your, your current job is they are looking to see what are you being fired are you being terminated is the company closing and most people not all most people what they do is they go from one the same field to another field so for example, if you were leaving Xerox to go to Canon, 
and say, hey, listen, you know, why are you leaving your current job? Well, if you said something like, you know, my territory is shrinking, um, my vertical marketing platform is being shrunk by the company, I don't have as many opportunities, um, then that's the, that, that is the, the, the thing that you're dealing with. So again, uh, you know, those are, are the, the questions you need to answer. So again, it, it's one of those scenarios where you, um, you need to have, um, you need to have, um, you know, so, some background. And one of the things that, that people will also look for is if you tell them, why are you looking to leave your current job? Well, you're a competitor of ours and I see the growth and the potential in your organization that I don't see in ours. That's a fine, that's a fine answer to a difficult question. Now, those, you know, understand that, that, you know, they're looking to trigger a response. You know, that is one of the things that they're, they're looking to see how you respond to certain questions and to certain scenarios. Because again, they can't, people just can't come out and, and run you through some, some of the questions that they really want to ask you. And, and, and I, I understand that, it, you know, as an employer, it, it's, it's difficult to ask certain questions because you have to frame them. So, you know, one of the things that you can't ask, what religion are you? You know, are you married? So, so there are ways to get around the are you married part. Um, are you free to travel? Part of this job, is, you know, bona fide occupation skill set is that you need to travel one or two days a week. Are you capable of doing that? Now, if here, here's the, the response to that. If you're honest with them and say, yes, I'm able to travel, um, then, then say, you know, say that. But here's one thing that you don't want to do. You don't want to get in a position where you say to them, yes, I'm able to travel. And then you don't, you get in that position and you, you say, oh, I have the kids or I'm, you know, that, that will automatically you'll, you'll find, they'll find the revolving door for you. They'll find a way to kick you out of the organization. Be honest with them. And again, one of the counters to that is, is are you free to travel? And he says, well, if I'm not, am I eliminated from being a candidate for this position? That, that, you know, and that's a good response to that. If, if you are, well, then, you know, maybe this isn't the position for you because one of the things that, you know, a, a company has an obligation to you, but you also have an obligation to the employer to be a, you know, an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. So, you know, don't take a job just because, well, I mean, if you're just looking at, you know, to get out from working at McDonald's, um, you know, that is, that's one thing. But if you just, you know, if you just need a job, I mean, there's, you know, go work at Amazon until, you know, they make $16, $17 an hour. You can go over there and work until you get, you know, figure out what you're going to do. But if you're talking about, I'm talking about real positions. So again, you know, be honest with the company and, you know, then again, they will be, you know, they should, most, most companies are, are very, you know, they're, they're not looking to, to do, you know, crazy stuff. But again, those are kind of the questions they ask you. Um, you know, and, and one of the things that they, you know, that there are some pitfalls questions, but again, it goes back to what are they looking to accomplish? Now, I, one of the, I, I'm going to spend some time for the next uh, few minutes. Um, we have one of my uh, fellow veterans, Wade Lynn Waddell is on the show. Wade, say hello. Hey, how you doing, everybody? So one of the things that I don't know if you got a chance to listen to a little bit, I, I was talking a little bit about pitfalls when people are applying for a, a job and actually getting to the interview process. And okay. And and so one of the things that, you know, that I, I was talking about, uh, you know, when people ask questions like, you know, what is your biggest weakness? What, one of the things that they look at is, are, you know, are you able to self, you know, introspect and, and take a look at yourself and be honest with yourself if the position so deems you. Um, 
you know, why do you want to work at this company? Those are the kind of questions that people take a look at. Now, you've obviously, you know, you've interviewed at, at a few companies over the years. Where have you, you know, where have you seen some of the pitfalls that you, A, with veterans, but in general when you're interviewing that you ran up across a, a, a question that just hit you so off the wall that you're like, I, I wasn't really prepared for that question. You know, it's funny is that um, the most bizarre thing that to ever happened to me was it really had nothing to do with, with uh, being a veteran. I, I walked into an interview and the gentleman sat down, introduced himself. I introduced him myself and he said, okay, so bullshit me. And I said, I, I'm sorry. And he said, bullshit me. That's what we do. You bullshit me and tell me what a great employee you are. I bullshit you and tell you what a great company it is. And we see who believes who. And then he laughed and said, no, but seriously. And then we went on with the interview process. I thought that was an interesting way to start and not, not the way that I would recommend anybody start one by any stretch. Uh, and I'm really using that anecdote to kind of like draw a little time so I can think of an answer to direct answer to your question. Um, I've spent many more years, um, as an employer, uh, after the army than I have as an employee. Um, right. Uh, I, I guess, uh, uh, the, 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 the stumbling blocks that I had were, were ones that you mentioned and, and this, the one most specifically being, you know, what, what do you see as your weakness and, you know, and what, you know, where do you see yourself, you know, five years from now, what's your short-term goal, what's your long-term goal. Um, and, and I found those stumbling points mostly because I wasn't prepared to, uh, you know, at the time to look in, look inwardly and go, okay, so what are my weak points? And, and, you know, what exactly are you looking for when you ask that type of question? Uh, and, and that was the part that, you know, the, about that, that caught me off guard. Right. Um, Cause I think part of the, and, and I think this is the one thing for veterans is when you're used to, let's say they, I, I don't know what the average age of a veteran is right now that's separating from service. It used to be a lot um, lower than it is now, but I think people are, are staying in the service a few years longer, um, you know, because there are some people that are getting in and, and, and staying to 23, 25 years old. Now, I think in my, in our era, in the eighties, you know, people were getting out at 21, 22 years old. That's not the case today. Uh, you know, we're having some older veterans leave because of separation from, um, from separation from active duty because of, you know, whether it's drawdown or mission, you know, mission tempo, they're, they're leaving the service a little bit older. And I think that that also makes a difference on how you interview. And I think that one of the one of the issues that is being that is running in today is that, you know, as a veteran, you're also going to be behind your peer group when you're interviewing for a job because they're, you're going to be a little bit older maybe interviewing for the same positions and then you don't you don't have some of that let's say institutional knowledge that they do you know and right and well and on the, on that note i would also say that that nobody nobody going in listens to the advice that those of us coming out always gives which is to get the 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 advice that we give is you know train for something that you're going to be able to use on the outside and then if we're if right. we happen to if we happen to halfway listen to that advice, a lot of the times we fool ourselves into, or we talk ourselves into um, taking the MOS so we want to, because, um, uh, well, let me rephrase, uh, we take the MOS we want to, giving ourselves a, a BS uh, uh, idea of what it'll be like when we get out. I can tell you that I, I went in, you know, as when I went in as armor, my whole attitude was, you know, it, it, either armor or nothing, no tanks, no thanks. Uh, and, and when I heard, you know, my own dad say, listen, you know, do something that you can train for something you can use on the outside. I went, well, you know what? It's a tank. It's a track vehicle. So are bulldozers and so are these and so are that. And I can always do that when I get out. And it's a whole different creature. They are nothing, nothing, nothing alike. But right. I talked myself into that. And now here we are, you know, even, even outside of armor and, you know, outside of, uh, PLDC and, and, uh, and VNOC, uh, none of the other schools that I went to are, are applicable in, you know, in the real world situation. So right. now you, you have veteran, you have veterans who, 
who first off, most of our veterans uh, anymore are coming out of combat situations. So we've got the, the leftovers from that to deal with, whether you deal with it from a position of strength or it debilitates you either which way. Um, it's something that, you know, we, we go into a job market with people who uh, a lot of times haven't been down on that, don't understand, you know, where our perspective or where we're coming from. And it puts us behind the eight ball to begin, to begin with. And, and certainly, um, while the, uh, I can only speak from an army perspective, but while the army, you know, says that it's, you know, they want to set us up to succeed when we, to, when we get out and, and they can, you know, give us all the, uh, intern separation training, you know, that they want to give us. The fact of the matter is a lot of us just want to get off post. Yeah, so we and, yes, and sir, yes, there's... sir, three bags full to get to, to complete our packets, get signed out at, at, you know, at HHC and be gone. Right. And then, you know, there's a lot of things like one of the things that I, I, I bring up to people is that some states now, again, I don't want to say, I don't want to preach things as gospel, but for example, some states, uh, when you get out, when you separate out of the military, you have unemployment benefits. Now, yeah. n- not all. St- Here's the thing: Ohio is one of those states that do. Not all states offer that. So, this is one of the things too that when you you, Ohio is also a right to work state. Now, and again, those are some things that you need to know when you're going to apply for a position that. Some states, for example, are going to require you in a position to be a union member. So if you're mm-hmm. not, you know, like if you if you join the iron workers in some states, you're going to have to be an iron worker union member to be in that position. And those are some of the things that I, I think that aren't those. That's a nuance that isn't taught to somebody going out. One of the other things that I. I I bring this up because I, I, I was, if you were listening earlier, I had gone to. The, I used to work at, at Conic and Minolta, and one of the things that was part of my uniform or you know my dress was I had to look. I, I was a major account executive. I had to look like an IBM banker, you know, which is dark suit, white shirt, you know, power tie. Well, that is not include, you know. As you know, um, it, it's expensive to keep a wardrobe. You, you know, a tie is going to cost you sure, sure. thirty to forty dollars. A, a, a shirt um, is going to cost you fifty to sixty. A suit, you yep. know, a, a, even a decent suit is going to. I mean, even if you go get, you know, some of the cheaper suits are still three, three, four hundred dollars. And that is something sure. you've got to account for. And one of the things that I, I, I don't think, what, one of the things that happens, especially with veterans, because they have, you know, they haven't been taught this because somebody tells you what the uniform of the day is. Somebody tells you, mm-hmm. okay, you're going to be in, in in class A's, you know, in in you know BDUs or camis or whatever. Somebody's telling you that now. If you have to work at a bank, you know, or a position where you're a salesperson, are you being, you know, what is the uniform of the day? What do they expect you to do? It, you know, is a suit and tie what they're going to expect you to work, you know, work in every day, or is it going to be business casual? So again, those are, right. you, know, you know, those are some of the things that, you know, I, I think there aren't always, always taught and, and a tie and, and suits are going to be expensive. Now, obviously you can get by on two suits and, you know, rotate a, you know, you could wear a black suit or a dark suit every day you know, and just change your shirt and a tie, and then you could get away with that for a long time. But sooner or later, sure. you know, that is going to um, – look at your shoes. A, a, a good pair of shoes for – a good pair of dress shoes is going to cost you $100. I, I mean, you're not yep. going to – you know, and again, those are things that – And people underestimate the importance of that. George, you, you've, oh. read, you've read my – my dissertation on that. And if I, if I can brush on it for just a second, as an employer, when uh, there are several things that I look at before I even interview somebody, when they're walking up to the building that I'm in to interview, I'm noticing things about them. And among those is your shoes. And do you have, have you taken the moment to, to shine your shoes? See, people don't understand what nonverbal cues really are at the end of the day. Right. And 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 you can be, yeah, you can You're be right. dressed in the nines and, and be wearing a, a you know a five hundred dollar pair of shoes, but if they look scuffed up, 
then that tells me as an employer that you are not paying attention to detail. That means you're not going to take, if you can't take a, to a time to represent yourself at your best, then that means that you're not going to take the time to pay attention to detail and represent my company at your right. best. And also, you know, there's, there's a couple things that people do that are, are absolutely, one of the things that I always tell people, uh, you know, offer a good uh, firm handshake Look them in the eye yep. when it, if yep. they tell you and th these are a couple telltale signs, too. If they tell you that the job interview is at 11 o'clock, be there a couple minutes early, like five minutes early. Don't show up 15 or 20 minutes early, because, again, it, it if you show up too early, it, you know, people are going to say you, it looks like you're too desperate. That That is one thing. It, and there's an article online is to. Why Navy, and it's written by a Navy SEAL, is show up at the time that you said you're going to show up. If they say 11 o'clock, be there at 11. Um, be, don't be there at, you know, at, at 1030. Be there at 11. Be at the at the appointed, you know, place and time that you're there. One of the other right. things, drink a glass of water before you go in so you're not licking your lips or that you're, you're, you're smacking your gums. And that's, again, that is something that you you don't want to do. One other thing that I always, one of the things that, that was taught to me when when I went to the, the IBM sewing school was before you go in to the company, look up their financials, look up their, you know, look up their 10K, which is the, which you can look up in the Edgar database. It's their online filing for publicly held corporations. Now, if you're not going to work with on, on, if you're not going to work for a public company, you know, look and see if there if there are press releases about this company as a private company. Know where you're walking into so you don't say something completely stupid. Number two is, and again, it, did you how did you hear about the job? Because you know that's another equivalent. That's a trigger question. Where did you find out about this position? Because if you're, you know, were you looking through, like, what's a couple of the job sites? Monster.com. Um, yeah. You know, there's a... People are advertising like crazy on Craigslist over the last few years for, for jobs. Right. And those are the kind of... Both help wanted and, and seeking... Right, but there's a couple of them. But let's, let's 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 back up really quick to, to something you just said, though, George. You said look up the company's financials, <laughs> and, and something that that uh, something else that people need to really keep in mind is that we are in an information accessible technology age. That right. means that right, wrong, or indifference. When you fill out an application and you turn it in, your application has your name, it has your phone, your contact phone number, at the very least the city that you live in, and it's real right. easy to simply plug somebody's phone number into Facebook and pull up their pull up their Facebook account. And if you're if you don't, it, it, you know, put, post whatever you want to post, but but put in the proper protections to make it so that nobody gets access to your to your social media that you don't want to have. I mean, you want to have controlled access on everything because as an employer, again, if I happen to look you up and your your personal persona, now, I know somebody sitting out there right now saying, what I do on my time is my business. You're 100% correct. But if what you do on your time <laughs> is is something that, that is, uh, you know, di I, my, I and my company are diametrically opposed to, then... Right. I'm not going to, you know, even give you the opportunity. So you got to be really, really wise about what information you allow people to have access to. Right, because part of the part of the problem is that again, if you're sitting there doing a job, you know, if you're going through a job interview and you're looking through the, you know, you're looking for employment, you're an agent of the corporation, you're an agent of the company. So I'll give you exactly, and, and I'll give you an example. This is something that people don't think about and and again this is so <clears throat> under the the dodd frank act you're not allowed to work for two banks at the same time now i you're going well why is that important well here here's one of the the issues that comes up what happens if you are applying for a mortgage you're applying for a mortgage banker position and you're doing something on the side 
that could be construed as a financial representative of a <clears throat> of a institution. And, and people don't think about it. So, I'll give you an example: you go to you do Prime America on the side, and then you go apply to be a mortgage banker. You know, those are kind of things that. Uh, you know, those are some of the, the things that people don't think about. So again, I think one of the one of the issues that you have to you've got to be well prepared. And and I say this also too on the flip side of that. How did you find out <clears throat> as as a, a candidate? How did you find out about this position? Because one of the things that happens out there too. And I want to be, and I I don't want to say that they're not leery or any of that, but how did you know to apply at this company? Because there there are some scams out there where people send in their resumes and they're used for, mm, you know, find, uh, identity theft. So be you know be yes. care be careful when you see some of these job inter interviews online that offer these jobs that sound too good to be true. Those are pitfalls as well. Now, I want to I want to cover something that me and you talked about earlier, and this is a a sticking point to some. There, the salary is always. It seems to be the salary position is always one of the most difficult questions to engage in because here's two things I found out. One is. If you ask for too much money, you don't know what the position entails. If you ask for too little money, then it looks like you're too desperate. You're too desperate. So, not only not only does it look like you're too desperate, but there's a perceived value. If you're asking for too little money for what the position is, then again, as an as an employer, my automatic assumption is that you don't have uh, a, a level of experience that I'm going to have confidence in because if you, ha if you were worth more, you'd be asking for more. And, and again, not, not don't be outlandish with your, with your salary requests. Um, right. but you know, you, you lose as much by, uh, by undercutting yourself as you lose by overestimating your value. Right. And, and I think that that's one of the, um, that's one of the, the things <clears throat> that, uh, that you've got to also be, Lyria, because again, a lot of companies, a lot of corporations, the way that they now, not everyone, but I'm saying a lot of them, they go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and they look at some of the jobs based on what it pays in the area. Now, some of them have corresponding pay, some of them don't. I, I mean, there, there's not always a you know, there's not always a, a, a correspondent. How did they come up with that position? But a lot of companies, they look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics is is one of the, the questions that they come up with. Where did you, you know, mm -hmm. how did they, they're paying? Because if you are getting a, a, a candidate, for example, a, a sales position and the, the market is paying $80,000, and you're offering sixty five. Well, you're not getting that that caliber of of employee. You want to, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the 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 other questions about that too is if you're not paying them enough, um, are you going to get? Are you going to have higher higher turnover in that position than if you just paid a, a little bit above the industry average? Um, Wade, I want to. In, in one of the um, Doc Marston, I'd like to introduce you to Wade Linwoodell, Doc. Say hello to each other, and Doc had a couple of questions that he wanted to to cover as well. Hey, Doc. Hey, Doc. How you doing? Not too shabby this evening, hello? sir. <laughs> good, good, good. Oh. And you as well. So, hey, George, real quickly, if I if I, I want to throw throw a thought out there before we segue, because otherwise I'm going to lose this train of thought. Um, when when talking about uh, the uh, the reputation of companies and so on and so forth, some, some, another p little piece of advice that I really want people to take into consideration is to stop putting your name on the on people you don't know. Right. <laughs> so you work at you work at company X, 
and I come to you and say, hey, listen, um, I, I know you work there, and my little brother's going to be applying right there. You know, can he use you for a reference? The abs- answer to that is absolutely unequivocally no, because when you put your name on somebody as a reference, okay, that comes back on you if that person winds up being you know, less than desirable, because now if you, if you do that, with, you know, again, with, with, with my company, I, I'm not going to necessarily knock you, but then you might have a, a viable candidate come along and say, Hey, this person, you know, is, is, you know, great for this position. I'm going to look at you and be like, yeah, the last person you sent me wasn't all that hot. So be very, very, very cautious about, uh, about putting your, your stamp of approval right, cause you're val- on anybody that you don't know. Cause you're vouching for somebody. And one of the other, and and here's one of the the things that happens with that too, is that if you get, if you always got to be willing to answer some of the bad questions as well as the good. So, for example, one of the things that people ask, and and especially today, is um, if there's space in between your resume history from jobs, why? And you have to be able to answer that and, and answer that honestly. Let's say you know, that one of your companies relocated out of town and you weren't you weren't able to leave, well, that's a viable answer. But at the same time, if you got fired for a position for, you know, negligence or anything else, um, you, you, you're going to have to, you know, step on the carpet about that too. Um, Doc, go ahead. And, 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 and guarantee, guarantee any time that you say personal reasons is why you left a position – we already know that you got released or that you couldn't get along or adapt in one form or another. Right. Now, now I'll sit back quietly. Again, Doc, I'm sorry to have stepped on your No, 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 that's that's fine. Go ahead. No, that's fine. I'm used to it. So I think what I've seen over the last several interviews I've actually been in is that over a five-year goal, what is your five-year goal? I don't think they're looking so much for personal as much as, are you willing to stay with the company for that five-year time frame, and are you willing to grow in the company? Would you agree with that statement? No. No, because um, – and I'll tell you the reason why. Some positions are not meant to be more than five years. If, it, it, For example, if you and, – and, and I'll say this. Because we're, we live in such a fluid technology-driven economy – a lot of the positions aren't going to be there in five years. So if a company hires you for some, now for some positions, yes, if, if you're an officer of the company or, or a high level manager, like a VP or those kind of positions, senior executive, yes. But what they're looking for is, are you able, are you able to manage and look at goals? That's one of the things that they're looking for. Now, if they know, for example, the, Let's just pick an industry that, as an average, has a high turnover rate. The the car sales industry, the the car salesmen have a high turnover rate. Why? Well, one is that it, it has a lot of pressure in it. Number two, you there's a, a certain level of trade craft in it. Uh, the of all the business of all the salespeople in any in position, the most desired people in all the in in sales industry believe it or not are copier salesmen why because it is one of the um the longest sales cycles so that is some of the things that they're looking for i i don't i could be wrong about this but i don't think the 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 from the people that i've talked to about the three to five year where do you see yourself in three years where do you see your five years is are they able to succinctly spell out a goal and to be able to create a pattern of success. Now, it could be with that company, it could be not. But again, with today's turnover rate, I, you know, most people in five years aren't with most companies. I find that interesting because with me just achieving my degree is that with certain groups within the diesel field is that for instance, in the Midwest, we have Fully, which deals in Caterpillar equipment. They right. want to see that you actually are able to tra- keep moving and advancing through the company because they push for advancement, self-advancement. What are you wanting to do in five years? But that also depends on what group you're actually going and working for. So like you said, it depends on the company. And, and it so, also depends, and, and I'll say this, there's certain positions that 
again, our, our industry, let's <laughs> say industry specific, and, you know, maybe, Wade, you can step in on this. If you hire somebody that, you know, for example, you've had a, a, a publicity company, do you expect people to be with you for five years? Or do you, do you see, because <clears throat> your, your field has such a high turnover, that you're just seeing for them to take a look and say, hey, look, this person knows how to do goal-orientated projections. I can live with that. Um. I'll be honest with you, George. I look at people uh, for their longe longevity, and the reason for that is it, it, there's a lot of things that go into to um, to. It's not a matter of it just being uh, being in the field of, of public relations or publicity. Um, specifically, as you know, I work with with high profile celebrities, right. so I've got to know that that the people that I bring on board are very very trustworthy know how to keep them you know keep their uh, keep people's information to themselves and it takes a long time before i'm comfortable just letting them have access to clients who who you know are of, uh, of a uh, of a caliber that uh, you know the wrong thing the wrong thing said can can damage a relationship or a business relationship that's been in place for so very long or even one that's just begun because I work in a, you know I work in a, a specific area that that is a lot of it is word of mouth as far as uh, you know right. your reputation can be you know it, it, your business reputation a lot of times is, is a lot like a bank you know you could you could take years to build it up but spend it all in a second too. And it's even, right. it's even more foolish if you, you know, put the wrong person into an accounting position to have access to your, you know, to your, your bank as it were for back, lack of better terms. Uh, so yes, I look, I look at, uh, at people for their longevity because there's a lot, you know, there's a lot that goes into training in, in my specific field. And I, and I, and I don't think this is just with my field. I think this is in, in a lot of areas. Like, again, to, to, for instance, I say, you know, I'll say, okay, you, uh, you went to school for public relations. Excellent. Have you got any uh, publicity experience? Oh, no? Okay, that's something I've got to consider. Okay, you have public, publicity and experience? Or experience? Great. Do you have publicity at working in entertainment? No, I got to consider that. Yes, okay. Do you have publicity working specifically in the music industry? And, and everything gets kind of narrowed down. And, and no, I'm not going to find necessarily, uh, you know, the, the 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 unicorn that's done it all and, and knows exactly everything. But I am looking for uh, for people who have, have got who have put in a little bit of time into what it is that they're doing. Well, and I and I'm going to close on on a couple things that too that employers are doing to, today that they haven't done in the past. One of the things that that they've done, they're doing today more so than, and especially in trust positions, they are running, not only are they running background checks, but they're running credit checks on their employees. Because if you are a, a, a risk in some positions, they might not hire you. So, you know, mm -hmm. that, that's something to, you know, to keep, you know, keep an eye out is that if you, you know, make sure that it you know again they're looking you know if you're a sales rep for example in certain and you're handling cash or negotiable instruments and you have you know 530 credit score you might not get hired if you're a mortgage broker and you've got a couple bankruptcies you might not get hired so one of the things you know, to, go ahead i'm sorry i didn't mean to do it to, i um you know when i when i was talking about um when I, when I spoke about about the longevity thing, um, part, I, I, I read recently um, Bruce Dickinson's book, and and uh, Bruce Dickinson, of course, of uh, lead singer of Iron Maiden, um, his book, and something that I found interesting that that Rod Smallwood, who's the longtime uh, uh, manager for Iron Maiden and for Dickinson specifically, uh, an anecdote that he told about him was that he, you know, uh, Smallwood hates. To do's, he hates to be at to do's. He, you know, he does what he does, and he's very, very good at it. But the industry threw a to do for him, uh, you know, celebrating his years of success uh, in what it is that he does. And some some young manager came up to him and was was saying, "Oh, I'm I'm a really big I'm I'm a real big fan of of your work and so on and so forth." And and Smallwood looked at him and said, "You think that I work in the music industry or that I'm in the music business?" And the guy said, "Well, yeah." And he said, "I'm not." I'm in the Iron Maiden business. 
Right. And and I say that because uh, when you when you talk specific, when you talk about about uh, about the longevity piece, um, people want to know that that you're uh, to use the uh, my dad's old expression that you're, if you're going to ride, that you're riding for their brand. Right and, and and know that that that's what you're going to. I don't mean you know go sleep with a with a publicity manual you know for a pillow, but I need to know that that you're invested in what it is that we're doing. Uh, the, right, and, the, and, if you and, remember, and the, while it's a movie, Jerry Maguire made a great um, a, a great illustration of that when you know when Maguire was getting fired from the from the big uh, uh, agency, and here he's in one room calling all of these people, and then and, you know somebody else is over here calling all the other people and trying to you know get everybody on their side, and that's a dangerous thing that that happens. That happens for real, and that's why we want to make sure that people are going to have that long term, uh, you know, that longevity and and the desire to stay in a position and get in and grow with the company that they're in, that they're in. So, right. And, and again, you know, like I said, that is in, in certain trades, I would say that in others, I, I, I'm not always dead set on that. And, 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 that, and again, that's, that's a perspective. Um, we've got four minutes left. Doc, any final thoughts, questions, observations? Learn to read the body language of your interviewer that can really go in your favor. Keep your own body language to a minimum. Okay. Yeah, I mean that that does help a lot because I mean, and the other thing is, I will say this: when you're when you are facing a, you know, don't ever sit. Uh, and and this is a body language one one hundred one, but don't sit opposition from him be, from an interviewer because it it's too adversarial. Tilt your chair a little bit to one side or the other because it makes it look like you then are trying to ally with them. And, and that's a little trick that also is, you know, that was taught. Also, one other thing, and this is a, a you know, 101, don't bring too many items into your interview. If you're, go- if you're a guy, it, one folder or, you know, a briefcase, um, do not bring your you know, do not bring your jacket or, I mean, a, a, a raincoat into the interview room. Just bring a, a, you know, a folder that you can write down questions. And the and the most, if you don't have a an answer, this is one thing I, I will recommend. Uh, yes, no, I don't know. Keep it like that. If you don't have the answer to something that a, a, an interviewer ans- asks you, do not make something up, say, I, I'm sorry, I, at, at this time, I don't have an answer for that. Um, the, and the last part is when you leave, regardless of whether they offer you the job, don't offer you the job, send them a thank you letter. They you know, they took time out to interview you. Send them a letter. Even if you know that you're not going to get the job, it, it, it shows a, a level of courtesy that sometimes that makes a big impression because it might say – your resume from going into the uh, circular file. Wade, any last thoughts? Uh, no, not no, I don't. Um, I want to thank both of you guys for coming I, on. The- I'm sitting here feeling badly because I didn't realize that we were on a time schedule, and so Doc probably had a lot more to share, and and, and I did, you know, I, no, I didn't no, no, no. Need to Doc, dominate Doc, that, that portion of the conversation. Doc is a, uh, a current, uh, you know, he's a he comes on the show numerous times, so he's a pretty, uh, you know, regular. Um, we just have a, a, a show coming on after this. But anyway, gentlemen, thank you for the, uh, for coming on the Warrior Wallet, and thank you for your time, and I appreciate the uh, the input. So with that, uh, I, you know, like I said, I, hopefully, like I said, so you guys got some information uh, this evening that normally you might not have gotten with, and it, just some stuff to think about. Look, again, fi- you know, we do the Warrior Wallet, a lot of this is boring things, but hopefully if you just get one or two pieces of information that help, maybe it will help you down the road. And you're, like I said, I want all my veteran friends and all my friends period to be successful. Um, this is George Pardos, and thank you again for listening to the show.